video. Can you hear me? Yes, I yeah. can hear. Okay, great. Um, so I will say this is not a, a new and unique thing. We've been on a lot of video conferences over the last two weeks and, and there's always some technical glitch going on. So I appreciate everyone's patience. The one thing that I can say um, that's really exciting is that this is definitely the best dressed uh, meeting that I've been in in weeks. So um, that's just making my Friday right now. Um, I'm, I'm going to be uh, pretty quick in kind of talking about what we do. Um, but Sarah and I are at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta and we work in the Center for Workforce and Economic Opportunity, which we started um, just a couple of uh, years ago. Uh, with a, and, and our, and our mission is to focus on employment policies and labor market issues that affect low and moderate income right? populations. Um, now we are, we're a center that works across the entire Federal Reserve System and the entire country. Um, and, and really our, our goal is to be a bridge between um, the research that the Fed does in the real world. So we hope that we can help support the things that you are doing and, and pr provide some information uh, to everyone. So. This is just a, a quick look for those of you all that maybe can't see things. This is what we look like. And, and again, it's, a, it's an effort to, to give everyone a little look at um, a face today. So we're going we're gonna to jump in. And I just want to say that we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we've been seeing uh, happening since March, um, how we're seeing that it's affecting workers. Um, and then start to look at what some responses and ideas are. And I, I will say that one of the really great things about um, doing this is that I think that we're going to be able to hear a little bit more and we need to know some of the context of everything that's happening. So to the extent that you can, we would love to hear about um, things that are disruptions that you see, even kind of contextually to the organizations that you work with and um, policies that you're shifting or changing and ways that you're thinking that you're going to need some, some resources. And then we'd love to know um, ways that you think that the Federal Reserve can be helpful. And just given the amount of folks that we have on the call today, um, which we are very excited to be joining you, and I echo Stu's um, comment that this is the best dressed I've been all week for this meeting. So it's been, uh, it's nice to be with you all. Um, and uh, we do ask that you utilize the chat function um, to send us your questions. Uh, we'll be stopping kind of throughout and prompting for various uh, kind of uh, context and ground truth and kind of confirmation on what we're seeing and, and what we're seeing in the data, whether you're feeling that. Um, but we also want to learn more from you. Uh, any other comments? And as, you know, Stuart just mentioned, what are things that you're tracking? What are policies that you hope to see changed or that you have changed? How can we be helpful? So um, I believe the chat is actually at the top of your screen, not at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, but just be, feel free to send those to us uh, throughout the conversation. We'll be able to triage as they come through. But just to give you kind of a background uh, in what we've seen happening just in this last month so far, and I'm sure this is going to ring true to most of you, but this is obviously a very, you know, kind of uh, quickly unfolding public health crisis. Um, you know, there's going to be very unique and specific effects on the labor market uh, and the workers that are affected because of that. So this started with some fast um, growth in the stay-at-home policy, work-from-home telework policy, and various strategies to keep businesses open. Um, and then that quickly devolved into further job loss, um, disengagement, significant um, temporary business closures. Uh, obviously, there's been this drastic increase in unemployment insurance claims, as I should, I'm sure everyone has seen the numbers just were released a few days ago, and, and this last week was the highest week uh, of a single jump in insurance claims that we've seen since labor has been tracking that data. Um, we just got a look at um, kind of that state by state data yesterday so that we could get a little bit of uh, a picture into what's happening specifically here in Georgia. Um, so the claims the week of uh, March 7th were around 5,000 and they jumped up to 16,000 last week. Uh, I can assume that these numbers will continue to grow just as some of these uh, closures have continued to, to take effect in the Atlanta metro region. But obviously there's been a mass reduction in in-person job loss. Uh, online systems uh, nationwide have had limited capacity to, to handle the increased traffic, making that far more challenging to process claims and to provide that direct service uh, remotely um, to our participants and the people that we support. 
Um, and of course, there's been an influx of challenges in managing for childcare, for remote working families, and for the emergency workforce um, that is still required to, to report to work, but you know, with absence of childcare uh, providers being available or schools being open, um, you know, we're tracking a number of those issues as well. Um, we do have an understanding of, of some of the local realities here uh, in Atlanta. Um, so just recently, uh, as of, uh, you know, I believe it was earlier this week, was it, or, or late last week, um, the non-food service and hospitality entertainment businesses uh, have been closed or further restricted. Um, there's been a temporary moratorium on residential evictions in place for 60 days. That executive order was signed on March 17th. Uh, we have the emergency fund um, that we have to support some of the food programs, uh, homeless preparedness and the, and the like, uh, and then changes to UI. Um, so the waiting period's been waived, job search requirements have been suspended, um, and then workers with reduced hours or that have been otherwise affected because they're either ill themselves in isolation or taking care of a family member, um, they are now eligible for UI, which is also a component included in the current stimulus bill. Um, I think that we've had a handful of chats coming in here, um, uh, so I can take a quick uh, kind of peek at this um, as these questions come through. Thank you, Stu. Um, but what, you know, one of the questions as to why Georgia um, uh, unemployment rates are, are lower as compared to other states, um, and I think that I agree that that's been the timing of the closures that have been driving this, and we've been tracking kind of state by state. Uh, and a number of different changes that have happened both at the state level and local levels around closures and seeing how that kind of domino effect has been, um, has been reflected in some of that employment data. But I do believe that it's because that the statewide business closure just occurred two days ago. Um, the Atlanta closures were just recently preceding that. Um, and there was plenty of other states that had uh, those closures uh, put into place um, much earlier. So in just moving forward with, um, you know, some of the questions that we're asking of ourselves and some of the data that we'll be able to share with you today, um, you know, the focus of Stu and I's work is on that low and moderate income population. So we're, we're um, acutely tracking uh, long-term, short-term and long-term disruption uh, effects on that lower income worker population, certainly those with less formal education, we're also looking at what's happening across different industries, different occupational uh, kind of uh, clusters, uh, what's happening with folks that are working within smaller firms that have been temporarily shut down, that we're concerned about, uh, you know, cr credit access uh, and the ability for those smaller uh, sectors and businesses to be able to weather this recovery. Um, we want to really understand who can adjust their work environment to actively telecommute versus those that cannot. And we'll jump into that uh, far more deeply in some of the data that we'll get through today. And then particularly focusing on the policies and practices to keep folks engaged who cannot work currently. Um, so those are some of the components that we're tracking. But, you know, I did want uh, folks to, to let us know what are other questions that you're trying to answer now or that you're tracking as this pandemic unfolds. So please do use the chat button. Um, I'll be able to jump in and kind of triage some of these questions as Stu is going over some of the uh, recent uh, research and, and analysis that we've done, just to give you a different picture of, of the ways that we're trying to kind of slice the, slice the reality and really understand what's happening. So Stu, I'll send it back over to you and go on mute and, and kind of the questions. Sure. Um, so I, while we're um, while we're working on, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about just some of the data that we have seen going forward. Um, I think that for for this crowd, it's not going to be a surprising thing to see that the that there are not a ton of workers nationally that can work from home that could work from home. And so what you'll see also is that we know that that tracks very highly with. Uh, the rates of, of formal education that people have and a move towards a knowledge-based economy. But we know that, um, that this presents challenges for a lot of workers. Now, I will say that this data comes from um, a survey that includes up through 2018. And so these numbers could be a little bit different given kind of the, the situation that people are in. But we know that there's, there are a lot of people that cannot simply work from home uh, given the line of work that they're in. Um, 
one of the other things that we we also were interested in is is what what the actual nature of of work from home is. Um, while there are plenty of people that can work from home completely or need to work from home, just given the structure of, of their job, um, many people can only perform a portion of their job at home, catch up or, you know, complete a, a restaurant schedule or a, a staffing schedule at home, but they could not actually do their whole job uh, from home, which creates challenges. And the industry that you work in has a big um, effect on your ability to work from home. So uh, not surprisingly, leisure and hospitality jobs and transportation uh, and wholesale and retail jobs are, are difficult to, to perform remotely. Um, less than 10% of, of hospitality workers even could work from home. Um, now I want to just talk a little bit briefly about some of the things that we've seen happen in, in total hours worked at small businesses, as we know that they um, are also firms that have some of the, uh, have fewer resources to cover workers who are out of work for some period of time as we've seen um, happen. Now what you see in this graph is the comparison to, to two months prior. So when you look down at the bottom and see March 22nd, that's compared to January 22nd. When you look at March 18th, that's compared to January 18th, but we've seen a reduction uh, steady and, and rapid reduction in the total hours worked at small uh, at small businesses over the last two months um, on on March 22nd reaching 62% fewer hours worked in small businesses. Um, now we don't have specific um, metro data, but we pulled uh, the data that was available for states um, in the southeast and and as you can see um, the trends are basically the same in terms of national trends. Again, this is that number of hours worked. And while um, some of our states and Georgia perform better than the country, there's still a 50 plus percent reduction in, in hours worked in, in the most recent dates that we have, um, which is also actually seen in the number of small businesses that are still, uh, or that are operating. If, um, I think if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, nearly 40% of, um, of, of businesses have, have uh, stopped operations in this period. In Georgia, it's a bit better. We're in, in the mid 30%. Um, anticipating a question about what the uptick might have been on March 23rd, um, because these are comparisons, 60-day comparisons back and forth, it's likely that um, we shouldn't read too, too much into that. There's, there's likely just some some bounciness and noise in, in this data. Um, but then also the other question is, so workers that cannot work remotely, how, how do they manage that time out of work? Whether it's for a 14 day quarantine or a longer period, um, as we know, uh, workers who earn lower incomes have less paid leave. The lowest 10% of, of workers have only uh, about 30% of, of those workers have any paid sick leave. This does not get into the amount that they have, but just simply whether they have it or not. Um, those numbers look significantly different for higher income earners. And then uh, it's just also important to note that COVID affected industries have less leave options available. Again, if we look at the service uh, sector, there are fewer uh, paid sick leave days or paid vacation days to help people manage that time uh, away from work. So uh, I will just say that on the horizon for us is we're, we're really interested in, in unpacking some of those uh, trends a bit more, figuring out why there are downturns in some specific industries, but also in a situation like this, um, and particularly uh, I think instructive to workforce development audiences, is understanding that there will be some increases in hiring and, and opportunities for workers. And we need to help people uh, think about career transitions and, and what common skills people already have that might help them pivot in a, in a situation with a, a rapidly changing uh, set of employment opportunities and figure out what some of those short pathways are from, from occupations that are quite negatively affected by this to, to fields that have higher demand. Um, we will have some information coming out on child support policies as we know that the, the significant disruptions and moves to 
um, virtual learning and school physical closures over the next couple of months are going to have big effects on on a number of places and, and workers. Um, I can speak to that both uh, kind of broadly, but also from from personal experience. It's a, a new experience to to be serving as a teacher and a, and a worker uh, during the day. Um, so just to, to prime the pump uh, for some discussion, uh, what in the data rings true to you? Uh, what else um, are you all watching and tracking that we could uh, try to take a look into? And, and are there things that we, that we missed or, or areas that we could provide some support from? Uh, so I, with that, um, please you know, be thinking about those questions and put some thoughts into the, into the, into the chat function. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about some of the, the responses that we've seen um, kind of in the, the very early days of this. So thanks so yep. much. And then some of the comments that have come in so far um, are on whether that there's uh, options to kind of supplement to get folks up to that 40 hours of pay, um, looking at the salary versus hourly effect on unemployment. Um, and we have some ideas about that that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, a question as to whether or not there's been a nonprofit um, inclusion uh, in the current stimulus package, which I believe that there is, um, but I don't know the nitty gritty details around that. But Joy, thank you for um, kind of raising up that Karen uh, Beaver at the Georgia Center for Nonprofits is, is kind of tracking that um, for us. Um, uh, and then <clears throat> a question, if, whether or not there are any favorite sites that objectively summarize the stimulus package. There's a handful. Um, the one that I've been going to uh, pretty much daily is the National Governors Association. They have a coronavirus page where they're tracking day over day updates that's happening both from a legislative level, but also uh, tracking what's happening state by state uh, in the absence of national sweeping change through these, um, through these bills. So that's something that I've been um, looking at every day that I found to be particularly helpful. Um, in terms of summarizing the bill packages, uh, you know, I would say just, you know, in my experience in this field, uh, that there's going to be some places that have a better summary than others, but once that goes through um, today, I would imagine that uh, NGA is going to have some good uh, resource out there for you. Um, so, uh, hmm, one more message, sorry about that. Um, so, but then uh, thinking about some ideas that we've had um, and policy ideas specifically that are, you know, supporting for the work, uh, for workers themselves, we understand that, you know, the policy aspect of this is going to um, stretch well beyond just what's happening to the workers, but from an employer perspective and to the point earlier that was <clears throat> asking about, um, you know, some tips that you want to be able to share with your employers, we do know that many have developed um, new uh, programs to offer leave, um, specific <clears throat> policies that support folks that have gone into isolation because of exposure or because they're uh, caring for a family member. Uh, we believe that these will likely be um, uh, temporary in nature, um, but we think that those are fairly uh, effective strategies to be deployed uh, right now, given, you know, the, given the nature of, of the situation and how quickly it's evolving. Um, but the challenge on that is certainly replication for the smaller firms and folks without uh, a lot of on-hand capital to be able to float that cost. Um, ooh, we got a call coming in from someone else. If everyone can mute on their own little tiles, um, you can just unmute by clicking the, the red microphone. Um, some other uh, suggestions that we have or what we want to be able to continue to track um, and we'll see, you know, what comes through the stimulus bill and then where are there other gaps that could be filled through other funding mechanisms already in place with the WIO legislation. Um, so certainly rapid response um, that can address, those funds can be deployed to address what the layoffs that have already occurred or as layoff aversion. Um, so we are looking into what states have already petitioned for those dollars or what that's going to look like in light of this next stimulus bill. Um, and then to the question of which we've been dealing with quite a bit and is in, in the current stimulus bill at a change to UI that 1099 and gig workers would not be eligible for unemployment. Um, prior to that, uh, what we had found was that the National Dislocated Worker Grants are formerly the National Emergency Grants 
which are largely in place for any natural disaster or some significant shock to the labor market, which this certainly qualifies. Um, but there, there is a positive affirmation in that grant program um, to support 1099 staff. So these are some things that we've been thinking about um, and certainly want um, folks to be thinking about different ways uh, that they're looking at already in place funding streams that could support some of the, uh, the work that you're doing right now at not in current COVID versus uh, coming into recovery uh, and what that might look like. Um, additionally, there's some other policy uh, ideas specifically that we found. Stu recently wrote a Workforce Currents, which is a, kind of a blog post that we have on the Center for Workforce and Economic Opportunity site. The link will be in here when you all receive the, uh, when you all receive the deck. Um, but short-time compensation uh, is a small uh, program underneath the larger un unemployment insurance um, umbrella, also known as work sharing. Uh, it's currently in 27 states, Georgia not one of them. Um, but the Families First Act that was passed earlier this month does include um, assistance for states to establish and or expand uh, this program. Uh, so the workforce currents that we have goes into far more detail. And Stu, since you did the research on the back, uh, the background of this, I'll let you kind of jump into this program objective and function. Um, we think this could be something uh, that could be set up in Georgia so that as we're weathering not just COVID, but that that program is then in place in the future to address kind of layoff aversion uh, approaches and supplement workers' income to get them back up to that 40%. Sure. So I'll just I'll talk briefly about the program. Um, Short-time compensation is actually an unemployment strategy that a number of other countries use. Um, and the idea is to avert people from actually losing their jobs. Um, let's imagine that there's a 20% a drop in demand. And, you know, today maybe it's more than that. But um, that there's a drop in demand that, that would lead to having to lay off 20% of a workforce uh, by a firm just to manage that, that change. Um, instead of laying off 20% of the workforce, the short-time compensation program allows the firm to say, everyone's, no one's going to work on Fridays. We're going to take a day off every week and everyone's going to go from 40 hours to 32 hours a week. Uh, the the short-time compensation program allows for that to happen and then every worker at the firm that that shares in that to receive unemployment insurance for those eight hours um, the benefits of, of a program like that is that it helps keep people engaged in work which is which is really important uh, not only for for helping people avoid major disruptions in their income uh, but also in their employability we saw that as people were laid off in in the last recession um, that people that were laid off were often never able to kind of reattach to a job that was similar to the one that they had and, and dealt with oftentimes long-term um, unemployment because of that layoff. Uh, this, a, a program like this helps avoid those layoffs, keep people working, and, and then hopefully you weather the time through that, that low demand and, and get people back to work um, mm -hmm. full time without ever losing that. Great. Thank you so much, Stu. And another uh, question that came in was around WIOA youth programs. And if anyone's hearing about those opportunities for this summer, um, I encourage anyone else on the line, if they're aware of that, um, that's getting deployed locally or it's been reimagined, um, given the situation, to please share that in the chat box. Uh, I've made a note for myself here to take a look at what is happening on that front um, on a national lens, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we can be in a position to share some of that guidance back um, to you all. Um, so I want you guys to also tell us what you've been focused on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm particularly interested in what you're already thinking about in terms of workforce recovery strategies so that when we are back and open for business, um, how are we getting folks directly back into those kind of retail and hospitality jobs? Um, as Stu mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and that's something that we're gonna be uh, getting out here in the nearest term, is looking at how do we help with transitions from these downsized occupations into where there is current demand right now in responding to this crisis, but also into more, uh, you know, career pathways that uh, are able to better weather recessions like this. Um, and looking at the different types of uh, skill sets, the skill overlap, and what are the credentials that may be needed. 
Um, so I'm interested in how you all locally are thinking about that. Uh, I have some examples that we can share from other um, communities, but we want to dig into that data a little bit more. Um, but certainly, what else is needed to support your participants and the folks that you're supporting every day? Um, does the system need to incorporate new incentives moving forward? We've been talking quite a bit about that um, in recognizing that we have, a, we have an opportunity now to use the funding that's going to come down from the federal government to change the way that we are doing the work that we're doing and, and, and therefore changing the incentives so that our work is uh, more focused on kind of job quality and uh, economic resilience. Um, but any other additional funding allocations uh, that uh, you're hoping to get or that you know you would like to see or that you'd want to utilize from already existing funding mechanisms from within the system that we haven't um, you know heretofore discussed. Um, and then just generally speaking, how can we be helpful to you? You know, we want to do some more research and get some materials and, and uh, thought leadership out there that's going to be advantageous um, to you and to the field in general, but also just know that we're here for you uh, and you're welcome to reach out to us uh, at any point, even if it's just on kind of that one-to-one -one kind of technical assistance piece. And I know there's been a handful of comments coming through, Stu, have you been able to grab any kind of major- Yeah, I'll just, I'll mention that, that many of them are around uh, the summer youth opportunities. Um, mm -hmm, and it great. sounds like there are some exciting things happening in a number of county programs around the metro area, and but there's not a great kind of comprehensive lens or, or national look on how to do that. I will say that I've heard a few stories of, of local workforce boards or states that have committed to do things like double their hiring during the summer youth uh, programs. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be great as you all hear things if there end up being any kind of broad comprehensive strategies or things that would be, would be worth capturing. Um, please let us know. But I, I don't, I probably don't have a ton more um, than, than the kind of some of the, the individual examples that people have mentioned. Sure. And something that I just learned about yesterday that I'm hoping to learn a little bit more today and into the coming um, next week, uh, but the state of Tennessee is deploying what they're called the um, Tennessee Talent Exchange. Uh, and it's exactly to that, how do we preempt this workforce recovery and, and, and get together the folks where they have had to shutter operations versus ones that are in a mass hiring mode. So the connection between your retail and hospitality workers and the grocers or the logistics uh, you know, jobs to, to get all of the goods out to folks and how can you kind of broker the relationship between hey, we have now all of these people that are out of work and we have all of these people that we're trying to hire. Uh, and really looking at that at a high level to understand the skill differential and then pull in their education providers to be able to quickly put together, let's say, a week-long, two-week-long training program to get them those turnkey skills that they'll need to be immediately employable. Um, so I think that that's really, uh, at least on its face and in, con and in concept, a very promising model to... Um, uh, to continue tracking and seeing how that's working and potentially replicate uh, in other areas. So if there's any other, um, you know, thoughts like that or ideas that you all have percolating, please share that with us because we'd love to be able to uplift uh, new and innovative ideas uh, and how we're immediately responding to this crisis because, you know, everyone is, is moving 18 miles, 18 million miles an hour. They're shifting priorities day to day. Um, so any idea is a good idea at this point, uh, and um, we're just trying to, to keep track of all of that. Um, I do love this idea about online credentialing um, and how this is the perfect time for you to gain those skills and deepen that knowledge. Uh, just by virtue of a conversation we had earlier this week, we know that boards are thinking about that and how can they change eligible training provider uh, parameters to be able to include more online um, programs because, you know, we're moving away from the classroom-based training. And, and what does that mean in tracking their rigor, tracking their outcomes, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that there's effective performance metrics that are coming out of those programs. So that is absolutely top of mind. Uh, and another component that we can add to the, the growing list of uh, kind of how people are dealing with this in a time of 
uncertainty in, in assessing that value and how are they putting those parameters in place and, and you know, metrics and incentives uh, to pull in more online credentialing providers into the space. Um, a number of different things too. Let me uh, kick it back over to you so that you can highlight some of the existing tools that we have that we think would be very advantageous for the work that you're doing right now. Yep. Um, and then I can go back through some of the other comments here. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I will just say that one of the, I, I think that the question that came up about online credentialing is, is really important. Um, the delivery of, of training is obviously going to be moving on online for, for some time. Um, it, in many cases, probably was already virtual. Um, one of the things that we we encourage people to do is to think about um, not only the delivery of that training, but what what people are, are getting trained for in the, in the current situation. So there are some programs that are probably going to be that that will struggle to have jobs at the end of it. And long, uh, you know, several years ago, we created this tool called the Opportunity Occupations Monitor that. Uh, for every metro area and state. So we also have this available at the state level um, on our website. Um, identifies kind of across all of occupations in, in any given area. Those that are, are lower wage, um, those that are what we call opportunity employment, which is jobs that don't require a bachelor's degree, uh, but pay above median wage in the area, as well as higher wage employment. Now, while we, we've always wanted to look at kind of that middle segment, that opportunity employment segment, now's a great time to use it looking across the entire labor market to understand where there are high concentrations of any given occupation. And while we're hoping to build some information on where there are kind of common skill linkages and transitions, we understand that that's, uh, we, don't, we don't kind of have that mapped out now, but uh, it's a useful resource to get some labor market data. It includes not only um, government data like from the BLS, but we've, we've built this tool in partnership with um, Burning Glass and it includes online job information. So the information in this actually includes locally specific um, educational expectations for, for hiring. We will be updating it with through 2019 data um, in, in the next um, month or so. So look for that uh, coming out shortly. The other thing that I'll mention is, um, you know, there, everyone's going to be looking at the, the monthly jobs report often. Um, we uh, produce something called the, that we call the labor report first look, which is actually a disaggregated specific uh, to industry and households and, and many of the cuts that people would want. Uh, look at the data that comes out in that monthly job report. So in a, in a few weeks, we'll hear something about the unemployment rate in nationally um, in, in the first week of April. We'll hear about what happened in March. Now, that's useful information to know what's happening broadly, but it's also really important to know how uh, changes affect specific industries. And what, what you see on the right is just a one one of the graphics that's in that that shows you where there is growth in, in employment and losses in employment. Um, it, it is automated and it, it produces itself minutes after the job report. So the job report's released at 8.30 in the morning. This will usually be up by about 8.35. Um, so I encourage you to look at that to get kind of a more granular and specific look at what's happening. Um, then I'll just say that we, we have a number of kind of, uh, of publication uh, areas where we're putting out information on, um, on issues in the labor market and potential responses. We have uh, a longer article that looks at some of the remote working things that we talked about today, as well as the short time compensation program, has links to a number of the other policies that we've seen people adapt to, to try to use on this and, and some ideas. Um, and then in, in the coming weeks, we will have some more information on uh, reemployment strategies, particularly uh, utilizing uh, partnerships with the unemployment insurance system. We're doing some regional analysis to, to get some more understanding of the exposure to COVID and uh, affected industries or other pandemics to get at some of the questions of why, um, why certain areas are, are being more or less affected. So look for that. And there, there will be more to come. We've got a number of ideas um, coming, coming from, from that that we'll be, we'll be working to get everything. We'll be looking at the chat uh, 
and ideas that you all have today to come up with more that we can work on. Um, and then just speaking broadly about the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta's community development function, uh, we have another that's called Partners Update, which has a lot of regional and district specific information. So it's very focused on the Southeast. Uh, there you'll find more information on housing policies and small business supports and other community development strategies, um, specifically for COVID, but also just we, we keep that up to date always. So there's, there's years of, of information there. And I'll just say that our staff is, um, is one of our resources and we want to be accessible and helpful to you all. Uh, our websites are there below. You can find our contact information. We want to hear what's happening. Um, and we want to find ways to elevate what uh, is happening for you all and help make connections and provide analytical support that, that helps advance and, um, and be resurgent from everything that's happening. So um, we will, we'd, we'd be happy to take a few questions. Um, Amy or Joy, um, can you give us a time check or do we need to, uh, to transition now to some of the other things that are happening? We have a few minutes for questions, so go okay. ahead. And we have one of the questions that just came through and I just wanna you know, echo what Stu said that we're here for you and, and we wanna hear from you and have your needs inform our work. Please do reach out to us um, uh, at any point with things that are uh, top of mind to you so that we can at least swing some resources your way quickly or factor that into what we're, um, what we're analyzing going forward. One of the questions that came through that I think is um, very on point and uh, top of mind to me as well is this hiring rate and whether or not the new jobs that are coming online are gonna be permanent or seasonal. Um, so obviously the jury is still out on that. I think in some of these uh, functions, it's a matter of how is the world and life in general going to be fundamentally changed because of this and therefore will some of those positions be permanent um, because there's gonna be a greater need. Uh, for remote services and, and things that will like, but that is something that we're actively tracking uh, and getting more real-time data around the insights with the labor market trends and job postings uh, and what we can learn from, the, from that information as this unfolds. Um, there was a question around uh, whether or not if anyone's heard of a fund that gets dollars in the hands of worker quickly as possible as opposed to a loan. Um, I don't want to speak out of school on that specifically about what's happening in Georgia, Amy, or Stu or Erica, maybe you all have some um, uh, kind of thoughts on that. Uh, but uh, Amelia, thank you for sharing the Stand Together Foundation. They just started a program to nominate families to receive $500 in cash uh, and hoping to expand. Um, so that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, program to be aware of um, and to look at um, how you can tap into that for some of the participants that you're serving. But if there's anything else, certainly Amelia, or I'm not, uh, Amy, uh, Stu, Erica, Helen, anyone that uh, would like to weigh in and share here, please do. I, do. I don't know anything other than, you know, some of the things that will potentially happen with the, the, the stimulus bill, um, which, you know, I think without it being completely, um, voted upon, unless that's happened in the time that we've been on this, on um, has a number of strategies, including both supporting small businesses to, to avoid layoffs and keep people on payroll, and then some of the, the cash assistance programs that'll be coming from that are, are ways, but obviously um, we need to, to see how that actually gets um, administered once, once it's passed. So I think that there's a, this is a great um, kind of follow-up that Max can take. We can crowdsource some of this information from the network and compile that together. Um, so look for that to be um, at least a request for that type of information. If you have it, please send it to Joy and then we'll compile it all and share it. Great. And I can say for the Community Foundation, right, all of our efforts are quite honestly putting money into the hands of organizations that we know put money into the hands of individuals. So we recognize we can't, for, for us anyway, we can't do uh, direct sourcing, but we can make sure, and, and we are doing that, making sure that these are organizations that have direct lines. Um, so in essence, we're looking at it from a downstream approach 
Um, how do we get to the families? How do we get to the students? How do we get to the individuals directly? And what are the organizations that we know, we trust, have a proven track record of being consistent in doing that? And those are some of the first priority organizations that are receiving funding from this relief fund. Great, thank you so much. Well, thanks so much for spending time with us here this morning. I really appreciated all of your comments and I have a, a slew of notes on my end to look into with online credentialing, virtual internships, uh, youth summer programs, uh, FMLA effects on UI. So thank you so much for your uh, sharing your brains with us this morning and we look forward to a continued conversation. Thank you all.